I certainly hope that you all noticed the team ministry aspect play out today. I hope you see it from week to week. Sometimes we have different preachers up here, yes? Sometimes we have different musicians. Sometimes we don't see the people we're accustomed to. We believe heavily in team ministry because we're entering into the labor and the gift that God has given to us, which is so helpful to remember on this Labor Day. We don't labor in the labors of our own creations. We don't uh, find blessing in the work of our labor. We get to join in what God has already labored for us. Uh, you didn't create this day that you woke up into. You didn't create the air that you're breathing. You didn't create the eyeballs in which we're seeing one another and fellowshipping together. God has labored, and we get to join him in his labors. And that's what team ministry is about. So if you don't see Pastor Mike and, and Lori, it's because they're down, uh, joining in the labor that Christ has made possible to encourage a church planter about an hour south of here. What a blessing that we have that we have team ministry as we join in the work that Jesus is doing to build his church. Amen? Amen. What a blessing. Well, we also get to dismiss the kids, and they go learn about Jesus, and we have wonderful volunteers joining in the labor that God has provided so that they can teach our kiddos about Jesus. Uh, and then I would like to just pray for them as they go. God, as these kiddos go, as this next generation is serving as the, the youth kids were helping to collect offering, as the volunteers are helping to serve. We know that this is all how you build your church, one of many ways. God, I am so thankful for the joyful sounds of little kids, even one crying out, I need my Bible, Mommy. What a blessing. God, we thank you for that. We want to find even more joy in that. We would ask you to continue to bring children to this church and continue to stir in the hearts of volunteers that we would continue to proclaim how wonderful Jesus is to the next generation and bring youth, that, that more youth would be helping to serve in, in various capacities. Bring more musicians, bring more people to serve in the ways you have gifted and skilled them, and, and Lord, in some ways that we haven't even anticipated. God, we know that you have done all that labor and that we get to simply join in it and enjoy you. It is in Jesus' name, amen. If you have your Bible, and I, and I certainly hope that you do, I would encourage you to turn to the book of Hebrews, chapter 10. That is where we will be this morning. If you do not have a Bible, there is one in probably one of the, the bench seats underneath you, the little, little rack there. I would encourage you to make your way to Hebrews, chapter 10. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 4. While you're going there, I will let you know. If you don't know me, and I do see some some unfamiliar faces, and I've met some people in the lobby this morning prior to our service. I am Pastor Brian. It is good to see you. We are so pleased that you've joined us this morning to work through God's Word. Uh, some of us have been working through this particular uh, book for some time now. So if you are not familiar, I just want to encourage we have plenty of those recorded services and those sermons and a lot more material on our website uh, for the rest of you, we're just going to continue right where we left off. So let's go ahead and look at Hebrews 10, verses 1 through 4. God's Word says, Since the law has only a shadow of the good things to come, and not the reality itself of those things, it can never perfect the worshipers by the same sacrifices they continually offer uh, year after year. Otherwise, wouldn't they have stopped being offered? since the worshipers, purified once and for all, would no longer have any consciousness of sins, but the sacrifice, excuse me, but in the sacrifices there is a reminder of sins year after year. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Let's pray one more time that God would just open up our eyes. Lord, as we look at this passage of Scripture, and even as we drill down into one clause, reveal to us what you have for us this morning. Speak to us in terms that we can understand. Show us something, Lord. Guide us and direct us, Lord. We don't, we don't want your word to be empty or void this morning, so I would ask that you'd help us to be attentive to what you have provided for us. It is in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, if you are thinking that you've heard all the stuff that I just read because you've been here week after week, you are right. Uh, we've heard all this. A couple times, actually. 
Uh, Hebrews 8.5, for you note takers, says the temple serves as a copy of the good things to come. Hebrews 9.11 says Jesus is the high priest of the good things to come. Hebrews 9.6 and 9.25 discuss the necessity of the sacrifices that were being made over and over and over and over again in the Old Covenant. Hebrews 9.9 says the Old Covenant sacrifices can't perfect the worshiper's conscience. And Hebrews 9.13 states that the blood of Christ is far superior to the blood of bulls and goats. We've heard it all before if we've been reading along and working on this. The author of Hebrews is summarizing for us what he has just got done saying about the Old Covenant. And the reason for that is because he's now focusing his attention and being about ready to shift away from the Old Covenant. He wants to point out what we're shifting away from because he's going to make an even greater shift to put our focus and our attention on Christ starting in verse 5. So that's what this summary is providing for us. And at this point, I think that's wise. I think it's good that, that he is summarizing this up. I think it is critical that we understand this. We need to get this, which is why we dedicated six sermons to the section that this is summarizing. That's almost two hours of preaching, if you have been sitting in here, to this idea that we have. It's an important topic. And I do believe many of you understand what he's saying. Many of you remember things that we've walked through. You remember what we've discussed. Many of you really grasp this. And some of you are starting to get this as things are starting to penetrate into your soul, into your mind, and into your heart, even through the efforts of this feeble preacher and the others who've been preaching this text Sunday after Sunday after Sunday on this topic. So, well, I believe this is of vital importance. I know that most of you are getting this. We don't need, well, we probably could use sermon after sermon on this, but we, we need to, to maybe take just a little bit of time to drill down into something here that has sort of jumped out at me, and I, and I think it would be good for us. I would like this morning, since we've been dealing with this for sermon after sermon, I would like to go a little deeper than the summary, and I would like to to drill down into something that's not even a full sentence. In fact, it's just part of a clause. Now, maybe it's because I've been listening to too much Martin Lloyd-Jones, a preacher of the last century. He's often been called one of the last Puritans. Uh, this man gave six one-hour-long sermons on Romans 1.1 to open up his 366-week series through the book of Romans. Now, I'm not going to go that far, okay? We're not, we're not going to that extent, but I believe there is something in this one clause that I would like us to give our morning to. Okay, I would like you to look at Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1, the opening of this. Since the law has only a shadow of the good things to come and not the reality itself of those things, it can never perfect the worshipers by the same sacrifices they continually offer year after year. And what I would like to focus on is just that first clause, that the law has only a shadow of the good things to come and not a reality itself of those things. Yes, we could look at all the rest of the stuff, but this morning, this is where I would like us to take a laser focus into God's Word. And the use of shadow here is really fascinating. Okay, it's interesting to me. We need to remember that it is an inspired word choice by the Holy Spirit as the author of Hebrews was writing this down. And he used the word skia. Skia has three possible meanings. There's a ton of debate in the commentators. Uh, just tons of stuff here about what this use of shadow could be. I'm going to tell you the three meanings. Uh, skia could be shade or shelter from light and any heat associated with it. And the most logical translation of that would be the word shade which we don't see that here really in any of the trend. Nobody said this is the shade from the good things. Ah, keep me away from it. We don't have that use. But words have a range of meaning. These other two are very similarly related, and this is where the debate comes up. The second is the shape cast by an object as it blocks rays of light. Okay, that's a shadow. Okay, that's what we'd know as a shadow. The third definition is a mere representation of something real. And we would say in that term, a shadow as well. Now, a lot of debate gives us pretty solidly two options. And I'm going to tell you on the front end, I, I kind of think that it's actually the second definition, not the third. 
The third is it's, it's a representation of something real. I don't think that's the use, just the way we see it used. I think it's a shape cast by an object. Right? It, it's, a, it's something there, and it's showing us something else. Okay? Shadows work in this way. When you think about a shadow, they can be useful to tell us things about objects. We, we can look at a shadow and kind of figure out what the object is. How many of you have seen the picture from above? It went around on social media for a while of a bunch of elephants, but you can't actually see the elephants because it's directly above them, but the, sh- the sun is hitting the elephants, and they're actually what you see is the shadow of a bunch of elephants. And you know from the shadow, those are elephants. Even though you can't see the elephant itself, shadows can give us a lot of information. In fact, we can use a sundial, I mean, I can't. I don't know how it works. But if I saw a sundial, uh, we can use a sundial to tell us what time of day it is and even what day of the year it is based on the shadow. I've gone places. You see it. It works. We can use a shadow, and I have done this before, to determine the height of something very tall, like a very tall tree. I wonder how tall that tree is. By using its shadow and the height of a known object and the shadow that it casts, we get a ratio between the height of the object and the shadow, and we can determine how tall a very tall tree is by the shadow that it casts using a known height of something else casting a shadow. We can learn things about objects. How about this one? And I think this one's fascinating. We can learn the circumference of the earth from a shadow. And this guy named Aristosthenes used a shadow cast by two different known heights of known structures in two different cities, and he knew the distance between those two cities. Now, he did have a little bit of an error, but he still got very close because he didn't know the actual distance between the cities. Um, He discovered the circumference of the round earth. Let's remember that we're talking about a round earth in 240 B.C., And he was incredibly close, using nothing but a couple of known heights and shadows. That's pretty cool and pretty smart. I think the illustration that's being used here by the author is kind of being used in this way, that there's something from the shadow that we can learn about something else. The illustration is a shadow cast from the good things, and what we call the shadow is the law. That's how this was worded, right? The good thing is the new covenant, and Jesus Christ, who's the high priest of the good thing, uh, is is available to us, casting even the shadow, according to Hebrews 9.11, that Jesus Christ is the, the good thing that is to come, and the law is the shadow. The law shows us many things about Jesus, doesn't it? If we go into the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, we can see a lot of things about Jesus. He's there, he even preaches to the, the two guys on the, on the road all that the Old Testament said of him in the, in the discussion that he had. He points them back to all these things. There's a shadow of Christ there, something that we can see. But it's important to remember that, that the, the good thing is not the law itself. The law is actually just a shadow of the good thing. Okay, so what we have in front of us is a contrast between the shadow and the thing. Now, John Calvin says it this way. He says, The difference then, talking about this verse, which the apostle makes between the law and the gospel is this. Under the law was shadowed forth only in rude and imperfect lines what is under the gospel set forth in living colors and graphically distinct. Some of you are like, what does that even mean? I don't even know what you just said. He's basically talking about a painter. Any of you in here paint? I don't, so I don't know how helpful this is, but apparently painters will start to put a little bit of a rudimentary line. Hey, this is where the horizon is, this is where a person is, like kind of black, something, that they then come in with the color and they paint over all that stuff, but it generally helps guide them. Luther is saying the black lines are kind of what we get in the law, and the color is what we get in the gospel. I'll say it this way, maybe for those of us who live in the 21st century, it's like a coloring book. The law is like the black lines of the coloring book that are, that are empty, but we know what picture is there. And then the gospel comes in and colors in and over the black lines to create a vibrant, full picture. You could still see it without the color, but you saw it in greater detail with the color. Okay, So how blessed are we? Seriously, how, how blessed are we? The Jewish people did not get the full, beautiful picture 
and the glory of the gospel before them. They didn't get to enjoy it like we get to enjoy it. They didn't get to see it like we get to enjoy it. They're trying to put the piece together, and they, they got to see it in part, but not as we see it today. Okay, the gospel is visible in the Old Testament. Yes, absolutely. I believe that wholeheartedly, and I think if we only had the whole Old Testament, we would have enough to find salvation. But how much more beautiful is it that we get to see the color in the gospel right before us, and how much clearer is it defined and and it's easier to understand think about the difference between seeing the shadow of your spouse on the ground you go oh, that's my spouse and then looking up and seeing your spouse face to face one clearly shows a better picture doesn't it and we get to live in these times isn't that wonderful that's what's being said in this little clause the old testament is only a shadow of the good things to come but we get to see the good things. Now, this is why I think it's so important that we drill down into this particular thing. I've just told you a bunch of facts. I've just told you kind of what I think the author is getting at here, but now let's take it a little bit deeper. And technically, because I want to be honest here, and I want to be clear, and I want to be correct, technically, Hebrews 10.1 right here, strictly deals with the comparison between the Old Testament or the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. That, it, it's clearly discussing that. And that Jesus is our high priest and he's the good things. However, there is something else that this hints at as we read it. Something we can kind of sense is there. Something that we can feel is there, even though it's not strictly discussing that. There is very similar language found in 1 Corinthians 13, verses 8 through 13. So I'd like to encourage that we go there now. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 13, I mean, excuse me, chapter 13, verses 8 through 13. Some of you hear this at weddings, but I hope that you'll hear it maybe fresh and for the first time in context of what we're talking about rather than in that, that context. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 8 says, Love never ends, but for prophecies they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, this is Paul speaking, when I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put aside childish things. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will know fully as I am fully known. Now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. You hear the language in, in like verse 9 there. We know in part. Paul is saying, we don't have a face-to-face -face view yet. We're not seeing as clearly as we will one day. And how about verse 12? It says, for now we see only a reflection as in a mirror, but then, if you write in your Bible, circle the word then, that's critical, then we will see face-to-face. -face. Now, this really messes us up a little bit because we've got to get removed from or we are too far removed from the context. We, we need to think about what Paul would be saying. A mirror in Paul's day is not like a mirror in our day. Mirrors today are so crystal clear, you almost don't even know you're looking in a mirror sometimes, right? I suspect in Paul's day, the mirrors were a lot more like the highway truck stop mirror that's like a piece of metal, and you kind of go to examine it, and you're like, I think I see a reflection. Is that me? And then someone scratched some graffiti on it, which doesn't help the situation, right? You're like, I think I see myself. There's a little color reflecting back, but it's not so crystal clear. Or if anything, he's talking about a reflection that you see in a pond or a lake. How often do you use a pond or a lake to do your makeup, fix your hair, shave? It doesn't look so good. It doesn't work as well as we'd hope. He's talking about that kind of a view, not the crystal clear mirrors that we have today. He's saying, look, I can see and I can see color and I can see something, but one day I will see more exactly. I will see as if I'm looking face to face 
with Jesus one day, then. And when is that? Well, for Paul, who was writing this, he was talking about when he dies. Or if Jesus should come back before he dies. But in Paul's case, Paul died. He was talking about this time when he would look face to face. Not the shadow, not the blurry reflection, but face to face into the perfect eyes of Jesus Christ. What must that have been like for Paul in that moment? Let us not forget that this man, an apostle, saw the face of Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus. He knew exactly what he looked like. He looked into those eyes before. He'd heard the voice. He had seen as if face to face Jesus Christ. And that was when Jesus was saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And yet he still longed for that face. Probably every day from that point on, I've got to see him again. Not as a shadow, not as a blurry reflection. I just want to see him. I'm longing for What must that have been like for Paul? The first time, why? Why are you persecuting me? But looking in his eyes this time, I believe I heard, welcome home, Paul. You did good, man. You did real good. Paul, the same man longing to see Christ clearly, wrote Scripture under the direction and the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. What must that have been like? What must that have been? He's getting God working in him and through him, through his mind, through his heart, in his hands, in his pen. He's working on this. He's writing Scripture. He's dictating Scripture. He's working on this, and he has it coming directly from God, not clouded by even his own thoughts. And yet he still says, we only see Jesus like in a reflection. He's longing for the clarity of seeing and knowing Christ. That day came, and he saw him face to face. There will come a day like that for us too. It's coming. It's coming for you. It's coming for all of us. When we will... Look, Jesus, eyeball to eyeball. We will see his glorious and beautiful face as he looks upon us. And I think the question is, will we hear, well done, good job, enter into my joy? Or will we have the tragic event when Jesus in his loving eyes looks at us and says, I never knew you. I never had a personal relationship with you. I'm glad to see you, but it's time for you to go now. And then you spend an eternity longing for the face of Christ, never to see it again, because it is withheld from you. It doesn't have to be like that. Because Christ went to the cross, because he died for your sins, because he made a way possible for you, it does not have to be like that. He said, for all those who would believe that I am who I say I am, who all those who would put their faith and trust in me, believe that I was raised from the dead, let me call all the shots in your life. Confess that I'm Lord. That's what that means when you confess that Jesus is Lord. You let me call the shots in your life when we see each other one day. You will hear, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into my joy. You made it. Let's go. And you will spend the rest of eternity gazing upon the perfect face of your beloved Savior. Forever. Not lacking or wanting anything. Because he will provide it all. If you are in here today, and you're even in doubt that you might not hear your name called by Jesus, the loving face shining upon you, you need to get this right. You don't even want to risk it. I want to encourage that you would please talk with us immediately after this service. Pastor Josiah, myself, Pastor Robbie, any... Turn, you could turn to the person you're sitting next to, and you might not even know them. Maybe you're a guest here. You could turn to them and say, hey, what must I do to be saved? And if they can't tell you, let me know. 
because we have this evangelism training class that Pastor Robbie's teaching. <laughs> this is of vital importance. We've got to get this right. I can't even imagine that I would have the opportunity to stand before you today, but one day when you stand before Jesus, he says, I don't know you. Let's not waste today. Amen is right. That's the picture we get here from this statement. We have a shadow in the Old Testament called the law that shows us Christ. And then we come to his revelation when he enters into humanity. It's that God enters into creation as a man to reveal himself that people could see him, that that could be written down, that it could be explained, that we could understand it in a little bit clearer picture, a little bit more and a little bit more, and that's what our life should look like, that we're going along and we're learning a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more, and we're, we're slowly getting that picture. It's becoming a little more clear. It started, as we see as an illustration from the whole of the Bible, in lines, fuzzy lines. It got a little more clear and a little more crisp, and then God is wonderful artistry, starts painting in the color, and we see Jesus, and we learn more about it, and this is happening, and that is happening, and we have our hope in it. And if you are not imagining your favorite painter painting a happy little tree right here on the shoreline, and how about this, and how about that, you should be, because that's really what God is doing with such tremendous joy Let's go ahead and paint this today. Let's paint your life, your salvation. It starts like this. Let's put some color in right here. Let's put this in over here. I have an idea. How about this? And how about that? And pretty soon it becomes the most beautiful, most magnificent story of the gospel in your life. That's what the Bible shows us from start to finish, from page one to the very end. Okay, it could be said like this. Maybe you've heard it this way. Jesus was predicted in the Old Testament. Jesus was revealed in the Gospels. He was preached in Acts. He was explained in the epistles. And now for us, he's expected in Revelation. That's the picture being rounded out, being painted to the fullest for us. And one day we will see him face to face perfectly. And it will look so much better than the painting that we've been seeing today. The law was a shadow of Christ. Today, we see Christ as if in a reflection. Even though we have a beautiful painting, it's as if in a reflection, and one day we will see him face to face. He will save those he knows. In our text in 1 Corinthians, Paul had mentioned that he would be known and he would know Christ. Are you known by him? Do you know him? If you do, I hope that you longingly desire to see him clearer and clearer and clearer and clearer until one day you see him perfectly. For those who don't, that face will be once seen and forever withheld. Don't let that be you. So here's what I'd like to do with this. We drilled down into just this one clause, this shadow. I'd like to conclude by encouraging you in some ways that you can see and enjoy Christ today. I recognize the author of Hebrews was saying, look, we have the Old Testament and you can see Christ there and enjoy that. And we have the, the New Covenant, but I think we have much more. We have Christ himself leading and calling and directing us. And so here are some ways I think that we can see, yes, only in part. Yes, not perfectly. I understand that. But let's see some. Let's enjoy. Let's let it get clearer and clearer and transform our lives. Here are some ways. And there's lots, but I have six here for us. The first is this, probably the most obvious. You probably know what I'm going to say. Let's remove the distractions and the temptations in our life that pull our eyes away from Jesus. The worship team, as they work through songs, always ask what the text seems to lead us to. And, and we only sing certain songs, so we're not teaching you new songs every week or going to the obscure hymnal of the old, old, old songs. Or 
I didn't think about this until literally this morning. There's a song. I know it's sung, and I think it was sung before. Maybe you wrote it. I don't know. It's an old third day song. And I say old. It's not that old, really. But uh, turn your eyes to Jesus. Some of you probably hear that being sung in your, in your mind. Turn your eyes to Jesus. Take away any of the things that would distract your eyes, that would distract your gaze, so that all you see day in and day out is Christ. Remove the distractions and the temptations that pull you away from Jesus. Number two is somewhat like it. Seek him out in his word. See the painting. Let it be filled out in your life. Enjoy it. Seek him out and see him. Treasure what you read and what you see. Hold it up in your heart and in your mind and think on it and, and feel it and see Christ come alive in your life as you seek him out in his revelation to us. Let those lines get filled in with a little bit of color day after day after day and see what happens. And for some of you, and I know I'm not going to look up because you're going to say, you look right at you and I'm picking on you. I'm not going to do it. I'm going to let the Holy Spirit do it. Are you ready? Some of you have never seen the whole painting. You've never read the whole book. My encouragement to you is until you have, you need to cancel all your distractions like Netflix and this thing and that thing and this thing, and you need to stick your face in this book and you need to see the whole picture. Half of you do it once, do it again and do it again and do it again and do it again. That's my encouragement to you. Number three, I'll look at you again. Number three is a little easier. Enjoy Christ through the singing and the praises to Him. We see Him in the, we have lyrics that are put up here that help us and guide us and direct us to, to focus our mind and focus our heart and feel the emotion in the song. Enjoy Him through the singing of praises back to Him. No, I need to say this, and I, I wish I didn't, but I do. Even if the songs are not exactly as you would prefer them, arranged or chosen, in the way that you would like, you can and you should enjoy Christ in them because the songs are not for your pleasure. Not at all. The songs are for Christ's pleasure. We sing to Christ to worship Him, and He takes pleasure in what we sing. Well, then where do we take our pleasure from? From Christ and His pleasure. So don't worry about the song itself. Seek Christ in it. Sing your guts out and praise Him. Number four, this will be easier for some of you than others. Enjoy spending time with the people that Jesus loves and has saved. Show up at church. Hang out with people. Go to lunch with them afterwards. Come a little early to chat with them. Love the people Jesus loves. See what happens. See what happens when you start getting around God's people who love Jesus too. And that starts to become sort of this infectious thing where all of a sudden we all start loving Jesus more and more and more because we're seeing how Jesus is working out in each of our lives. Start spending a little more time with the people that Jesus loves and see what happens. Number five, get so enamored with Jesus, so overwhelmed, so addicted to him, so in love with him that you can't help but talk about him with others all the time. You know when you get there, when the only thing you ever want to talk about is Jesus. 24-7, 365, and 366 on a leap year. Right? All the time. I love when I hear people go, I like that guy, but all he ever talks about is Jesus. I mean, that's a good thing. Praise the Lord for that. I'd hang out with that guy more, but man, he just wants to talk with Jesus too much. I had a friend. I have a friend. That's all he ever wanted to talk about. We were in Twin Falls for a brief period. His name's Dan Braga. He's a pastor. He's planning a church in San Diego now. He planted one in Seattle. He's helped many. The guy talked about Jesus all the time. And guess what happened to me hanging out with that guy? heard an awful lot about Jesus. Pretty soon I thought, man, this guy really likes him. I should look into this more. Well, that's interesting. I should read about that. I should do something. Somehow his 
love of Jesus, never wanting to talk about anything else, had a profound impact on my life. I want to get to that point where all I ever want to talk about is Jesus 24-7, 365. And on leap year two. <laughs> you just got to get so enamored with him, that's all you want to talk about. Finally, number six. Pray. Pray. Talk with Jesus. Talk with him as much as you can. Let him be the place when you have trouble, you go, what are we going to do? Hmm, I should phone a friend. No, I should pray. Hey, I really had this great moment, and I really want to tell somebody about it. Oh, I should pray. God wants us talking with him all the time. Through praying and hearing from him and talking to him and working this out in prayers, he is revealing himself to you more and more and more and more. In fact, I want to leave you with this really tangible, practical challenge. Someone challenged me with this years ago. I still do it to this day. I find it outstanding. I should have brought it, but it probably has a bunch of personal information in it. I have a prayer journal. Some of you are like, oh, I hate journaling. Yeah, I hate journaling too. I mean, like, I really hate journaling. I never go back and read my journal, so what's the point? For me anyway. But I sure like this, because here's what I do. I have a book. It's the journal entries are one line. One line is all I use for this. I have a little book, and I write the date. Then every one of these starts with please, because they're all the prayer requests that I want to see God do or whatever it is. Please heal so-and-so's cancer. Please help so-and-so come off the respirator. Please help so-and-so kick drugs. Please help so-and-so get the job promotion. All the things that I tell you that I'm praying for, I just write them down in one sentence. Please we would see more baptisms at Redeeming Life by the end of the year. Please this, please that, please that we'd have more musicians and a drummer. Please we have more church volunteers. Please, I mean, all the stuff. But it's one line. Just one line. Now here's where it's helpful. One, when I don't feel like praying, I remember to pray for you guys because I wrote it down instead of just saying, oh, I'll pray for you. I actually wrote it down. So it's a huge list. There's hundreds and hundreds of things on this list. Except when God answers... I go back and I find that prayer request and I draw a single line through it so I can still read it. I write the date and I write the answer. Yes, no, so-and-so, this thing, yep, got the promotion. Clean bill of health. What? Nope, died. Here's what I get to see, though, when I flip back through page after page after page of lined-out prayer requests. I get to see how God worked. I get to see how God answers prayers. And I write some of the simplest, silliest, ridiculous things in there because I get to see God work. So even if you don't want to keep a prayer journal, try this for the next week. Pull out a sticky note. Write six, seven, eight things you're praying for on a sticky note, and then watch what God does, even by the end of the day or the end of the week. Some of those are going to be no, and you're going to be okay at that, or not. Some of those are going to be yes. Some of those are going to still be there. I have a couple things on my prayer request list that have been there. I started this. I went back and looked. I started this in April of 2012. That's how far back my... And I have one thing with no line through it that I'm still praying for, still praying for, still praying for. But I got things in there, some of those things involve you, that I've seen for years and God working in remarkable ways. You know how this helps us see him? It shows us what he does. It shows us how he works. It shows us that he cares. You know how crazy it is when you, when you open that up and you see a line through like, help me find my keys. Oh, he helped me. <laughs> That's really great. Help me figure out the next sermon series. Help us find a part for the air conditioning unit. Help me get an A on this test. Or not an F. <laughs> you know? When you see God work, it fills out a greater picture and it shows you who He is. So I would just encourage, pray. Pray often. Pray as much as you can considering that that was the last item on my advice for you, I think we'll go ahead and take it and we'll pray together. Would you pray with me? Lord, we know that there is a, a shadow of the good things that we see. And we know that there is a reflection that we see dimly now, but that we will see face to face one day. And God, I pray that, that for those who know you, we will recognize that face so wonderfully because you are filling it out more and more and more and more as we walk through this journey as we're passing through on our way to see you in eternity. 
God, that we would, we would see that painting come together better over time, that it wouldn't just remain the, the black, fuzzy lines, but that it would be you. So I'm asking that you would, you would just paint another little thing in all of our lives today, this week, this month, that would just show us another thing about you that we would marvel in and, and wonder in and enjoy in and just be in awe of how you continue to reveal yourself to us. And God, for those who do not know you, they do not recognize your voice, I'm asking that you would penetrate deep into the hearts of souls this morning. You would work in the mind, and, and Lord, if it's not from the singing and the preached word and the, the written word and the, and the prayers, Lord, that it would be from someone speaking directly into anybody watching the video or in this room, that your gospel would be shared and received, that a new heart would beat, that a life would be newly born, and that one day when that life sees you face to face, they would hear, well done, child, you made it. That's my prayer that you would continue to fill this out for us as a church and as individuals. I thank you so much, Lord that you do continue to reveal yourself to us, that you do speak, that you do show us who you are, that you've not withheld yourself from us. And so, Lord, it is now my prayer that you would continue to make your face shine upon us and that we would be so enamored with it. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Why don't we stand? We have one more? Yeah. Let's stand and worship one more time, shall we? And sing your guts out.